Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about one of the anomalies of the lymphatic system, and that's actually going to be something called the vermiform appendix, or simply appendix. And the reason I say it's kind of an anomaly of these structures is because at one point it was considered to be a vestigial organ. And a vestigial organ is just an organ or tissue uh, that has lost its function over time and is not needed by any measure. So it's just there and it serves no function. Now over the course of the past couple of decades, there's been a lot of research done on the appendix and we've found that it's actually not vestigial. Um, it actually has some uh, cool functions. Um, I will say that even though it is not vestigial, you can live without an appendix, of course, because some people can develop something called an appendicitis and have their appendix removed. But in this video, we're going to go over some of these functions of the vermiform appendix or simply appendix. So vermiform is a term that basically means like the shape of a worm. Okay? And you can see the appendix right down here hanging off the bottom of the initial part of the large intestine called the cecum. And so if we go back to a little bit of digestive physiology, the terminal part of the small intestine is called the ileum. And the contents in the ileum will move from the ileum into the cecum of the large intestine before being moved up through the ascending colon. Okay, so this part down here is the cecum. And the appendix sort of hangs off the bottom of the cecum. Here's another image right here. Um, right here, here's the ileocecal valve, the opening from the ileum into the cecum, of the large intestine. And then the vermiform appendix just kind of sits right here. And remember that in the large intestine especially, that is a, a place in the GI tract where you have a huge community of bacteria. That's called your gut flora. And there's a lot of bacteria there. It turns out that without those bacteria, you actually become very, very sick. Um, you're not as healthy without those bacteria, which is why antibiotics can actually cause a lot of problems when you take them consistently. So you have a lot of bacteria, good bacteria, in the large intestine. One of the functions of the appendix here is actually to serve as a reservoir of commensal bacteria. When we say commensal bacteria, this is actually a term used in microbiology that implies healthy bacteria. So commensal meaning they go along with the function of the host, so they're not pathogenic. And so it's going to be a reservoir of those commensal bacteria. And one of the ways they demonstrated this was after a person goes through a, a pretty big round of antibiotics, that pretty much clears out the contents of bacteria in the large intestine and pretty much kills everything. And so what happened is when they killed those bacteria, um, the appendix actually kind of shunted its store of commensal bacteria back into the large intestine. So if for whatever reason there was something like a drug that wiped out the GI population of bacteria here, the appendix can kind of just release some of those commensal bacteria to accelerate the repopulation of the colon. Okay. Uh, it also serves as a lymphatic organ, secondary lymphatic organ that is. It's an important component of mammalian mucosal immunity. What that means is that the appendix houses B cells, which are of course white blood cells that generate antibodies, that is when they become ectoplasma cells, and then what we call extrathymically derived T cells. These are just T cells, but the extrathymically means that they are not derived from the thymus. They're actually derived from the appendix itself. Okay. And so we have both B cells and T cells. And so, and the way that this fits in with immunity and makes the appendix a lymphoid organ is that whenever contents of the GI, that is from the ileum, move through the ileocecal valve into the cecum, those contents can be monitored by these immune cells that are in the appendix. And if there's anything that's dangerous or pathogenic, then uh, the B cells and T cells in the appendix will sense that and they will mount an immune response against the pathogen. And this is one way that the appendix actually helps keep uh, the pathogenic bacteria population down in the colon and also maintains a higher population of commensal bacteria. Okay? A third function of the appendix is also going to be the proper movement and removal of waste matter in the digestive system. Again, you can have all sorts of foreign material um, that's not needed or, or it could be harmful. And so those B and T cells can also uh, flag those uh, foreign materials for destruction. Okay. 
Now, these are some important functions of the appendix, so it is not vestigial. Um, it does have function. That being said, you can live without an appendix. And evidence for that is the fact that people often get what's called an appendicitis. This is the most common pathology of the appendix. Let's actually look at the appendicitis in a little more detail on this slide. Okay. So with the appendix, and that's actually shown right here where my mouse is, here's the appendix, what we see is there's a lot of um, lymphatic vessels that actually um, drain and supply the appendix. Okay. So let's think about this for a second. Let's say that a lymphatic vessel that drains the appendix becomes blocked. Okay. So if the efferent lymphatic vessels coming from the appendix become blocked, well, the afferent ones that are supplying it with lymph, uh, they're not blocked. So you're pumping more and more fluid into the appendix, but if the efferent vessels are blocked somehow, then the fluid that's being moved into the appendix can't be drained, and so the appendix swells. And actually, the most common cause of an appendicitis, or inflammation of the appendix, is obstruction of the appendix. And that obstruction, one common cause, is lymphatic obstruction. So for example, if the efferent vessels become blocked, then you're still moving fluid that is lymph into the appendix, but again, you're not actually draining it. And so what happens when you have that obstruction is the appendix fills with mucus and it swells. And that swelling, of course, increases the pressure inside the appendix called the interappendicular pressure. And this pressure causes small vessels, that is blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, to be occluded. And that occlusion of those lymphatic vessels causes lymphatic stasis. And so whenever that lymphatic fluid stays in there, it tends to cause ischemia, or ischemia, which is failure to deliver blood to the appendix, and that causes death of the tissue, so it undergoes necrosis. Okay? Whenever the appendix starts to necrose, uh, this can trigger bacteria to be able to leak through the walls of the appendix, and that can cause the appendix to rupture. And when an appendix ruptures, that's extremely dangerous uh, because it can cause inflammation in the peritoneal cavity called peritonitis, then you get a bunch of bacteria that are leaking into that area and that produces sepsis, which can kill you. So an appendicitis, if it's not taken care of very quickly, very promptly, it can lead to death if the appendix ruptures. And so typically if somebody has an inflamed appendix, a lot of times they'll just remove the appendix. And the reason that they can remove the appendix is because even though it's not vestigial, you can live without it. Um, now it may make you a little bit more susceptible to imbalances of uh, gut flora within the colon, but you can live without it. So if there's an appendicitis, oftentimes if it's bad enough, they will actually remove the appendix, okay? So hopefully this gives you some intuition and understanding of what the function of the appendix is and how an appendicitis works. In the last part of this video, we're just gonna briefly discuss two uh, secondary lymphoid tissues, and those are tonsils and what are called Peyer's patches. So tonsils are secondary lymphoid organs that flank the nasopharynx and oropharynx. So I'm going to zoom in very briefly right here. Um, tonsils, we can see these, this cluster of tissue right here. This is the pharyngeal tonsil. We have a tubal tonsil that actually guards, so to speak, the opening of the pharyngeotympanic tube, which leads to the ear. We have a palatine tonsil and then a lingual tonsil. And these are also secondary lymphoid organs. Okay? They house uh, white blood cells, T cells, B cells, in the same way as the appendix and the spleen and the lymph nodes that we talked about earlier. However, the contents that uh, the lymph nodes monitor is different. Because they're situated in the pharynx, so that is just, uh, just beyond the extent of the nasal cavity and behind the oral cavity, they're going to monitor inhaled and ingested substances for invading pathogens. So if you have a pathogen that you inhale or that is in your food and you consume it, the tonsils can actually mount an immune response against it. Because when you bring that pathogen in either through the mouth or the nose, then that pathogen can be flagged for destruction by those B and T cells that are situated in the tonsils. And of course, just like in the case of the appendix, the tonsils can uh, become inflamed for similar reasons. Uh, maybe they can't drain due to the blockage of an efferent lymphatic vessel. And so they can swell and you have to get your tonsils removed. Okay? That's called a tonsillectomy. Removal of the appendix is an appendectomy. Okay? 
The last one we're going to talk about is Peyer's patches. This is a secondary lymphoid tissue. This is not an organ. This is very small. As you can see, these are just visible on the microscope. And these are present in the ileum of the small intestine. So here's all the villi of the small intestine looking at it under a microscope. If we look deep to the villi, we have these patches here that are present in the ileum, these little round regions. I'll actually zoom in on this so you guys can see this a little better. But we see actually one right here, there's another here, there's a third one over here on the far left. These are Peyer's patches. And we only see those really just in the, uh, in the ileum region of the small intestine. And what they do is they monitor the contents moving through the GI tract for pathogens. Again, they're playing a very similar role to what we've seen in all the secondary lymphoid tissues. So again, if you're moving contents through the GI tract, that is the small intestine, if there's a significant amount of pathogens in there, let's say, by the time they reach the ileum where you have Peyer's patches, those Peyer's patches may be able to detect the pathogens through their B cells and T cells that they house as well, and they're going to mount an immune response against those pathogens and attempt to destroy them. And so really to conclude this talk, we've in the past few videos gone over a lot of different secondary lymphoid organs or tissues, and what we see is there's a common theme with all of them. They house white blood cells, and they're monitoring the contents of something for pathogens. Peyer's patches monitors the contents of the ileum. Tonsils monitor the contents of inhaled and ingested substances. The appendix monitors the contents moving into the colon. The spleen monitors the contents of the blood. The lymph nodes monitor the contents of the lymph. And they all have these B cells and T cells that just wait there for the chance to detect a foreign pathogen and mount an immune response. Okay, so hopefully this has made sense to you and please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.